when we started this in 2004, um, it was an interesting uphill battle to try and get uh, people from both the scientific and the business side interested in talking to each other and in, uh, in deciding that they actually had um, a huge vested interest in learning each about what the other one did. And I see now with the, with the advent of the, of the new design for the School of Engineering and the, and the wonderful program that they're talking about putting together, both with the business faculty and the law faculty, that all of a sudden this is becoming flavor of the weekend. Uh, nobody could be happier about that than I am. So I, I just wanted to welcome you all here. I think it's wonderful. Um, someday I want to find that this lecture hall is uh, by a factor of four too small. And, uh, and we hope that, that that day won't be too far off. So uh, thank you all, as I said, for, for coming. I know that you'll enjoy Michael's talk, and, uh, and I certainly enjoyed my conversation with him when we were, when we were talking about what he was going to say. So uh, please enjoy the evening, and uh, we're really, really glad you're here. My name is Eileen Fisher, and I want to thank Eileen Mercier very much. Um, we're grateful to you for making this lecture series possible. Through your foresight and generosity, this lecture series is helping to bring together the worlds of science and business. Um, by showcasing scientific advancements to both the science and the business community, Eileen has demonstrated innovative thinking, and she is fostering entrepreneurship, important attributes that have served her well throughout her career. Her commitment to York and to the Schulich School of Business is truly outstanding, and speaking on behalf of Dean Deja Horvath, as well as the entire Schulich community, I can tell you we're very proud to have her as an alumna. Now, as the Director of Entrepreneurial Studies at Schulich, I know firsthand that innovation and entrepreneurship are key characteristics of our school. Schulich remains relentlessly global in our scope and reach. Construction has already begun on our new camp campus in Hyderabad, India, and it is set to open in 2013 in September. We've also just recently established two new satellite centers in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Mexico City, Mexico. Our community is richly diverse, cutting across cultural backgrounds drawn from Canada and abroad, and giving our students an unparalleled opportunity to build the collaborative networks that are so critical to entrepreneurial success. Real world, real world learning is another hallmark of Schulich. One of the ways that Schulich facilitates real world experiences and skill development is through our industry specializations. These include our health industry management specialization, where we focus on bringing health care in innovations to the market, and also our newest industry specialization in global mining management, the first of its kind in the world. The school's unrivaled offering of industry sector specializations provides an opportunity for students to use their own science or engineering backgrounds as a springboard to business entrepreneurship and product innovation in the tradition celebrated by this lecture series. The school is pleased to co-host this evening's lecture, and we look forward to hearing Dr. May speak. Dr. May is the chief executive of the not-for-profit Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine in the heart of Toronto's Discovery District. He completed his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Toronto in 1998 as a natural sciences and engineering research council scholar. He was awarded the Martin Wamsley Fellowship for Technological Entrepreneurship in recognition of the commercialization of academic discoveries. Dr. May's own professional network is formidable. He sits on a number of boards and advisory committees, including the Mars Innovation and the U of T's Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry. Certainly, it's hard to imagine anyone more qualified or better positioned to speak on the importance of building collaborative networks in support of entrepreneurial ventures in the healthcare sector. Please join me in welcoming this special guest speaker of this year's Mercier Lecture, Dr. Michael May. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, first of all, let me thank the students today for uh, coming to the, the lecture on commercialization. Uh, Dr. Mercier, thank you for, for sponsoring such an event. You know, in the, in the world, all of the interesting things happen at interfaces. And so the interface between business uh, and engineering or between law and engineering or business is really where the exciting stuff happens. And that's all part of building these collaborations. Um, I'm going to start um, by um, taking you to my morning commute. 
and trying to explain a little bit about what I mean by me, myself, and my network. Uh, this is the Gardner Expressway. It's usually much busier than this, and I'm usually sitting there on the phone or thinking. But when you sit on that expressway and you look at the network upon network that is, exists within the view, airplanes taking off, the trains moving goods, companies besides the, beside the Gardner uh, exchanging goods and services, um, the trees uh, uh, as part of the ecosystem. And, and then when you, when you look inside the car and you see that the people in the car have microwaves coming in and out, communicating, the, the uh, uh, information coming in and out, and then the human themselves being a network upon network of biological systems, me, myself, and my network really means that we are a network and we are interfacing with networks all the time. And if anyone didn't think that collaboration was important, no one told that to Mother Nature because all of these networks working together are all driving synergy, they're all driving, driving collaboration. And my experience uh, as an entrepreneur is that that collaboration, building the ecosystems to make uh, uh, entrepreneurship and commercialization work, I think are more important than the actual technologies we're looking at and the products we're working at. And so I'm gonna talk about starting a company uh, uh, from the academic environment, from an academic discovery, uh, and, then, and then the center that I've created uh, with academic leaders in the community uh, focused on regenerative medicine, which is really um, around uh, stem cells that I'm certain that we've all heard about, and how we're building an incubator that takes uh, the lessons uh, from our commercialization experience to build a very, very collaborative ecosystem for entrepreneurship. So here's some examples of networks. They're all over, people are studying them everywhere. In the top left corner is a representation of the internet. Billions of pieces of information but linked very, very tightly and closely through nodes like Google. It's a small world, a small world network, but a very uh, high degree uh, of information. And that's exactly the same kind of network that Ha, uh, makes uh, six degrees of separation possible. We're only five people away from everywhere else in the world. Uh, this is an opportunity to collaborate. In the center there is, is actually uh, the description of the network of stem cell scientists in Canada and how they co-author papers and collaborate. There's some interesting conclusions from that. This network here is actually produced by really the visionary and leader, the academic leader behind our new center, Peter Zanstra, which really um, uh, tries to understand the connection between blood stem cells and their progeny and the secreted factors that they give that drive that differentiation to mature blood cells like neutrophils and platelets. Uh, and on the right, that's an ecosystem that describes uh, um, uh, uh, some lake in Wisconsin. There are networks everywhere, and in entrepreneurship, uh, it is no different. So the premise, again, of my talk me, myself, and my network, our networks are embedded in what we do, in our success, and they're very, very important uh, to, uh, to entrepreneurship. So I thought I would take you back to my first uh, story about my first collaboration. I have to go back um, to when I was 12, sometime between building rockets in the basement and a hovercraft. I mean, I'm an engineer at heart. Uh, I read a story about a farmer who was burning the methane off of his pig's waste to heat the barn. So I thought that there was some magical component in feces that could be tapped for commercial purposes. So I had a dog and I collected my dog's feces for a couple of days and put it on the back fence to ferment. And then I built the only separation unit operation I knew, which was a distillation unit in the garage. And one afternoon, I heated up uh, the feces and, and I got a nice, clear, colorless liquid out the other side, which didn't burn. It was water. But I, no one in the neighborhood would come near me, and not even my dog would come near me. The smell was so bad. So my first attempt at commercialization and collaboration was not very successful. Um, but Rabbi Abraham Heschel, who was a friend of uh, Martin Luther King, said, the beginning of awe is wonder, and the beginning of wisdom is awe. Uh, and so um, when I came to university, that wonder that I had in science really became awe. 
And when I did my PhD, I did a PhD not uh, to go on to an academic career, but actually to try to figure out how we could extract all this wonderful science that I was experiencing, how we could extract it and make products out of it, and in particular medical products to, uh, to, um, for the benefit of, of patients. So that was my mission, and that's uh, something that I've been uh, focused on to gain that wisdom uh, ever since. And so the first way that I did that was we, my PhD supervisor and I, Michael Sefton at the University of Toronto, created a company called Ryman Therapeutics Limited um, based on a single experimental observation, a serendipitous observation of blood vessels growing in a rat around a plastic. Now we had been working on making these plastics or polymers inert so that they could be implanted in the body without causing any harm. But when we saw these blood vessels growing around the plastic and identified the contaminant that was responsible for that, we thought, wow, that's a unique concept. We can take something and implant it and make it have a biological function. And so we created this concept called theramers for therapeutic polymers. And we took that concept of an angiogenic polymer uh, that produced five times as many blood vessels around it, and we started to invent uh, new therapeutic polymers or theramers. And the other theramer that we invented was an antimicrobial polymer that, took, uh, that mimicked natural peptides in the environment in the body that can kill bacteria selectively because of the difference in bacterial membranes versus human membranes. So a polymer that when bacteria touched it, they would die, but it wouldn't harm human cells. And we also invented a material that inhibited what were called matrix metalloproteases. And that's a fancy long word for enzymes or chemicals in the body that break apart tissue. And if you can think of chronic wounds or anything to do with inflammation, those wounds are being chewed apart faster than they can heal because these matrix metalloproteases are chewing them apart under inflammation. So we created a number of these, what we called therapeutic polymers. Um, and the value proposition of this was really quite unique. You could have drug-like activity, so being able to inhibit something like these enzymes, but because it was a solid polymer or a plastic, you could have it regulated as a device, which was a much shorter pathway to market, so we thought. And the, because polymers can be made into all kinds of shapes and sizes and devices, and the chemistry was very versatile, um, we could use it for many, very many applications. So we had drug-like activity, a medical device-like regulatory pathway, and lots of versatility. And that was the basis of Ryman Therapeutics. Now, I talked to the students today about all the path uh, that was required to move these technologies forward, uh, and I hope I didn't scare all of them away from uh, thinking about entrepreneurship uh, or starting a company from academic research. But here's an example of that angiogenic polymer that we could put on um, diabetic mice and enhance the healing of these diabetic mice by inducing blood vessels to grow in their skin. And we not only showed that, but we also took that polymer and showed its safety through various tests and scaled up the production of that polymer. In terms of the antimicrobial polymer, again, it was a polymer that you could lay down on bacteria, and wherever that polymer touched the bacteria, the bacteria would die, but it had no effect um, on human cells, so anything under 10% here is, is biocompatible and safe. So no effect on human cells, but would kill bacteria. And we made this material in, to coat catheters and all kinds of other devices. You can imagine even coating doorknobs or anything where bacteria want to live. And then this MMP inhibiting polymer, um, we uh, demonstrated not only its mode of action, but we actually took this material to the FDA and got them over about two year period to agree that it was not a drug, that it was actually a device. And that was a major accomplishment and certainly supported the basic premise of our company as this therapeutic polymer company. And then moved this uh, technology towards a clinical trial where we treated these chronic wounds, these wounds that take months to years to heal uh, in, in the aged and we put it in the form of uh, wound dressings uh, and tested it in clinical trials. And 
In those trials on a number of different wounds, we showed that the MMP in hack activity or this enzyme activity was significantly reduced in these wounds. And more importantly, that that correlated with an improvement in the wound. Now, histology, I never understand histology. I'm sure you're all looking at this, but I'm going to make it really simple. This is a wound after only four weeks of treatment, the wound got better. It's not healed. But brown here, uh, brown stain here are the MMPs. And you can see that there's a reduction in the MMPs over four weeks. And here, what you're looking for is blue, which is collagen in your skin. And the more collagen that's there means that you're not chewing it apart and getting rid of it. So we did a nice clinical trial in, in wound care. Um, so <clears throat> over um, about a, an eight-year period or nine-year period, we launched a company from a single experimental observation. So about the earliest you can start a company. We built a portfolio of theramers and intellectual property. We achieved this device designation and regulatory approval, which is a significant um, accomplishment. We clinically tested the material. We raised about $13 million in total in, in public and private uh, funds. We got this to the stage of negotiating with strategic partners. And out of all that, there were many, many lesions learned for me uh, driving this forward with my mentors uh, and my board, et cetera. Now, there are a couple of lesions learned that I wanted to focus on. Um, one is that at the same time that we created Ryman Therapeutics, four other companies were created in downtown Toronto. Four other biomaterials companies were created. Only one of the five are still around today that are viable. And I asked the question, why didn't we work together? We were all within a block of each other in the same space. Every professor decided to start a company around their invention. And we were all competing for dollars uh, and all competing for strategic partners. I think that's something to note and something that we're changing in our new model. The other is that the links that I had to uh, the principal investigator or the, the professor that I started this company with, uh, and the U of T and the networking that I engaged in very actively over that time period was really what made us raise the money and be successful. Uh, uh, the technology was important, but um, over that time period, actively built a network around, and, and, and I told the students today, in large part around volunteering. I think volunteerism it, on boards is a great way to build networks in an environment of trust um, and, and, um, and you gain a lot from volunteerism. So um, now everyone's going to ask what happened to Ryman? It's not the one company that's viable. Um, and uh, I left the company about two years ago uh, and so did everybody else uh, soon afterwards. Um, the intellectual property still there. It really became a battle of visions. And uh, the company is not doing so well now, unfortunately. Um, but lots of, le uh, lots of lesions learned. So what am I doing now? We've taken these lessons and we're taking advantage of great leadership in the science of stem cells in Ontario and Canada and trying to build a new model for incubating that technology and those discoveries towards company creation and licensing um, and so if anyone doesn't know, regenerative medicine is the development of artificial organs, functional tissues, stem cells, biomaterials, compounds in combinations uh, or alone to restore or establish normal tissue function. This is the future of medicine where cures are possible around this certain cell type called a stem cell that can be any other tissue in the body. It's a fascinating area of science. And <clears throat> Of course, it's an emerging area. And this is an interesting curve. I'm sure others have seen it. Gartner's hype cycle of emerging technologies, where every technology goes through a, from a trigger, goes through a, a point of hype. And then there's this trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, where we finally have a stable industry. And this is the Gartner's hype cycle, according to myself and our chairman for tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine. And I want to note a few things. Everyone might have heard about Geron getting out of regenerative medicine just lately. They were one of the founders of this business, along with organogenesis and advanced tissue sciences. And right here, when 
Time Magazine said tissue engineering was gonna be the number one job of the future, that's when we started Ryman, right there. And then this is what we worked through. Um, but the industry, um, with now stem cells being researched in, in the US, and the, and the invention of this new type of stem cell that you can get from adult tissue, so now you can take blood or skin and you can make it into a stem cell. You don't have to get it from embryonic tissue. This industry has now started to act like a real industry where these companies that started, that went through bankruptcy, like Organogenesis, have now emerged, are dealing with manufacturing issues, and are real companies. And this is now where we're emerging to support this industry. Now, you have to start with uh, leadership in the science, and Canada is a leader in regenerative medicine, no doubt. Derek Vanderkoy has, has uh, um, reversed blindness in mice by delivering stem cells to the retina. Uh, John Dick identified after 20 years of bone marrow transplants what the hematic stem cell is, the blood stem cell. Andros Naj can make these new type of stem cells without using viruses, which is much safer. And uh, Mick Batty and McMaster doesn't now have to march uh, a, a, an adult cell back to be a stem cell, he can go right from a blood cell to a neural cell or a skin cell. Understanding this biology and doing this is being driven in Toronto, by being driven in Ontario, and there's great, great um, expertise here. Now, the industry itself, there's lots of numbers here, but the industry itself is growing in terms of its market, the investment in research now being in the billions, and what's interesting here is that they're now about 4,000 clinical trials in cell therapy going on uh, in regenerative medicine around the world and several companies emerging. So how do you take these discoveries, what I did in the past, um, and, and, and what are the challenges of moving them forward? And they, and they still are very, very significant. S starting a company is really easy. The easiest thing I ever did, making, pushing one forward over 10 years is the hardest thing I've ever done. So what are the challenges? There's a predominance of very early stage technologies in the environment. We see from our academic institutions, it's all very, very early stage. There's very little risk capital to invest in it. There's a lack of business and product development critical mass. We create companies prematurely before they're ready. We have under resource, resource technology transfer offices and inconsistent intellectual property or patent ownership policies. So this valley of death uh, is wider and deeper than ever. And the valley of death is that area between discovery and when a company wants to sell a product or develop it, there's a real gap in there of resources and expertise. This was a network that I showed, which was the collaboration among stem cell scientists in, in Canada. I, it's hard to understand, but out here are the non-collaborative uh, scientists. And what's interesting is that they're the ones that are apt to actually patent their work. So you have this friction between those that want to patent and create companies and those that are collaborative. And the collaboration, in my view, is what will make this successful. So it's an interesting observation. So what's the mission of CCRM? We're going we're gonna, to, our mission is to bridge this gap between basic research and, and industry and investment, uh, becoming a global nexus for regenerative medicine technology development and commercialization by focusing on bottlenecks in product development, so before clinical trials, and focusing on technologies, foundational or enabling technologies, being capital efficient, and that means using academic investment and infrastructure and building a network of collaboration, and I'll talk about that, and exploiting what's unique about our environment, and that we have great understanding of stem cell biology, but we have the engineers here as well. And you need the engineers to make the products and to advance the biology. And we have uh, both uh, examples of that in the, in the, in the Ontario community. You start, you start again with excellence. And six institutions uh, here that are part of the, um, the consortium of academic institutions uh, represent about 90% of the activity in this space in, in Ontario, uh, in the vast majority in Canada. And we've built uh, this consortium of academic institutions around organizations that bring together all of the scientists in the area. So all the scientists in Canada and Ontario have bought into this commercialization plan through their institutions and are linked together through these networks. 
research excellence, culture of collaboration, which is already there, and investment uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars in regenerative medicine is our starting point. We received $15 million from the federal government to seed this center. We've matched that with 10 million from industry and our institutions in terms of membership fees because they benefit from this. And we have a strategic plan that has three strategic thrusts. The first one is to enable product development like a company would. We are building um, core platforms that can take technologies in and we can advance them with our own team to a stage where they can be put into companies bundled together with more critical mass and are more fundable. On the other side, as opposed to driving through this gap from left to right, we're engaging industry immediately, bringing them on board, making them part of our network. And we're gluing an industry consortium uh, together with our platforms with a network that we're building and bringing our scientific leaders together with our academic leaders. So two of the three of these strategic thrusts are all about building the ecosystem and the network around capabilities, core capabilities, and the ability to actually advance the technologies in our own hands outside the academic environment, but with academic resources and support. So core platforms, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but cell reprogramming is all about making stem cells and making them from adult skin uh, or from blood. Cell manufacturing is about taking those cells and making clinical and commercial quantities of those cells. So if any of those trials that are ongoing right now are successful, the industry can't make enough cells to actually treat patients. It's a, we do not have the technology now to do this, but in Toronto we have that, uh, that intellectual property and expertise. And the third is bringing together biomaterials, my background, with these cells to create transplantable products for the future. Tissue that can be implanted or on the shorter term, devices to help with drug screening. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that. There are products out of each of these that can be commercialized and all together, they, here's an example of something that we can do. We can take a, a cell from someone with Noonan syndrome which exhibits cardiovascular disease symptoms. We can then make that cell into heart tissue. And we can use our bioreactors and technology to make enough of those cells to be laid down on chips so that we can test heart drugs, cardiovascular drugs on human tissue, not only from patients that have heart disease-like symptoms, but from patient with patient-specific samples as well. So sometime in the future, our, each of our tissues could be put down on these chips and we could decide up front whether I'm suitable for a clinical trial and you're not suitable for a clinical trial or a certain treatment and others. This will, is a major advance and opportunity in the science of regenerative medicine. And it'll be driven by Toronto and, and our center. 10, 15 years ago, protein production was down here and no one thought you could make a business out of this with manufacturing it's now increased 100-fold in protein. The protein business is a significant business. This is where we are with cell manufacturing. This is the opportunity to create a new kind of manufacturing in Ontario around cells and cell therapy. So there's a lot on this slide, but this is about building the network and bringing the best in the world to Toronto uh, to, to drive our center. So our board of directors has a VC as its chair, uh, for obvious reasons, and then CEOs from major uh, companies in the space, including Canadian Jeff McKay, who turned around Organogenesis, one of those companies that went bankrupt. We have Pfizer on our board, GE Healthcare on our board, Stem Cell Technologies on our board. The Strategic Advisory Board brings together not only the pioneer of these pluripotent stem cells, these new type of stem cells, but the who's who of regenerative medicine around the world from different institutions. And then we tie that strategic advisory board with the leaders from our local community in the space. These are all world-renowned scientists from the institutions that are our members, and we engage them very actively through this advisory group in what we're doing. So they're involved in what we do, but we drive the commercialization with our own facilities. And then our, we, we also tap into industry through our commercialization review. So if you combine these groups together with 
our industry consortium, which are companies that are really a proxy for the regenerative medicine industry, our network touches almost every activity, every product, every company, and every scientist in the world in regenerative medicine. This is about building an ecosystem for driving forward the, uh, the development of technologies in the space. And industry, it's a 20 company consortium, has really come to the table because our community offerings have been aligned with what they're asking for. Very well characterized stem cells, clinical and commercial quantities of cells, and then these advanced products that combine biomaterials with cells, mostly for drug screening at this time. So we're trying to take technology out of academia. We're aligning that with industry, and it's really about trying to bring these two worlds together. And what we do that's unique is we act like a spin-off company. When IP or patents come out of discovery at one of our institutions, if we find it promising, we license it into our center like a company would. And then with market pull and the money from our industry consortium, we put it into our platforms to develop a product or develop the technology to be licensed back to these companies. And at some point in time, as we create more receptor companies that are Canadian, they'll be licensed back to the Canadian companies. And this is, again, the ecosystem that we're creating. This is a very busy slide, but it's all about projects. And there are three sources of projects for us, one around patents that we get from our inventors. Uh, from our institutions and, and actually institutions now from around the world. We create projects around our industry partners because of the problems they're having, or bottlenecks or opportunities. We have our own projects. Um, but to date, after just one year in operation, we've evaluated or are evaluating 30 inventions. Um, and we have created 10 projects with companies to advance their technologies. Um, this is under a year, and again, it's about bringing all these players together in a very, very coordinated way. So let me give you some examples um, of how we're doing more than what a single professor might do to advance their technology. I told you about the drug screening, and I have to show you a video here. This is actually those heart cells that are grown between two electrodes, two pillars, and they've been made into heart cells and they're beating like a heart. And this is uh, very, very small, but these, this tissue can now be used to test drugs uh, that target the heart for toxicity or for the performance of the heart. Um, but we've take, that's something that one professor might produce. And, and uh, this, you know, this is the best in the world in producing these cardiac cells. But what we've done is we've taken that heart model here, and we're combining it with a liver model and a lung model and a blood-brain barrier and neural model to create a chip that combines all these tissues together. So that we're bundling technologies together and creating a drug screening platform like no other. And then what we're doing is we're not only doing that, we're, we're actually collaborating with some labs in the US and a company in the US that have microfluidics expertise, animal model expertise, tox modeling expertise to build an offering to the pharma companies to come to Toronto to do this drug screening. That type of collaboration has not happened in this field before. I mentioned Peter Zanster and this, this uh, understanding of, of how blood stem cells uh, can become uh, their progeny. Um, and this is all about uh, and will be a company creation for us. When a bone marrow transplant is done or cord blood from kids is used to treat blood cancer, what you want is to be able to implant uh, that tissue and what you really want are the stem cells there. Um, but um, we can't get enough of those stem cells with current technology. And, and Peter Zanstra has created a way of diluting the sample as it's being manufactured so that the stem cells uh, are preferentially expanded and not the more mature cells that come from those stem cells. So what this will do is, we can now, from one cord blood sample or one bone marrow sample, we can now get 12 to 20 times as much stem cells from that. So that will enable the market or the treatment of, of uh, blood cancers uh, to triple or quadruple with this technology alone. We're not just creating a company out of Peter Zanstra's technology. We're actually going to combine that technology with technology from Montreal and from one of our industry consortium members and technology out of Australia
to create a company, a Canadian company, that has much more technology and critical mass than the Ramon therapeutics that I created years ago based on one experimental observation from one professor in one lab. This is what we're trying to do. This is a technology uh, that actually comes out of York University. And Dr. Yusuf, are you, you should be here. So I apologize, apologize if I get this wrong. I have to try to explain this. Uh, and this technology came to us to evaluate as part of our center through a partner organization, Mars Innovation. But this is all about engineering cell surfaces. Um, and when I did my PhD, I did cell encapsulation. We had this idea back then that if you could, if you could uh, coat cells in a plastic and then make the plastic uh, have certain chemistry to bind with other cells, you might be able to engineer tissue. But we couldn't do that. But Dr. Yusuf has found a way to do this. He's found a way to create certain chemistries on cell surfaces by, having, by creating something called a liposome, which is kind of like a fake cell. It has the same properties as a cell. And by having that chemistry put on the surface of the cell, he can drive through chemistry cells to interact with each other. And then you can take those constructs and scale them up and have those combined together to create tissues and then organs and someday implantable tissues. This is an enabling technology for tissue engineering in what we do, but also could be used to track cells, to manufacture cells, because cells like to be on surfaces for drug delivery and tools and reagents. And I got a couple of videos here. I love the simplicity of these videos uh, because they, they, they you know, explain what's going on. So this is a normal, bringing two bubbles together with normal chemistry. And what happens when you bring two bubbles together, like bringing two cells together? They create an interface between them that can't be broken. And so you can't put the chemistry from one onto the chemistry of the other. So if you see these two come together, there's an interface between them and the cell and the bubbles, like cells would, come apart. They don't interface. But if you modify or dope the surfaces of these cells, whoops, with Dr. Yusuf's chemistry. Okay, go ahead. He's a great bubble maker. And if you bring these bubbles together now, they merge. And if you have one type of chemistry on the one that you want on the cell, you can then drive that, that functionalization of the cell and then use that to bring cells together in, in a very purposeful, engineer-driven way. And this is the type of technology uh, that we want to advance, and it comes from York. Now, what's interesting about this is it doesn't just come to us from York. It comes through other, um, other institutions that are driving this ecosystem that I'm talking about. Mars Innovation is another center of excellence for commercialization like ourselves that brings together the tech transfer offices of 17 institutions. I mean, that's an incredible accomplishment to bring that together. York is included. And that's uh, housed in Mars Discovery District in, in downtown Toronto as a convergent center for investors and, and uh, you know, support organizations and companies. And we work very closely with these two groups um, to, again, uh, uh, nurture this environment that I'm talking about. So, We've been around for one year. I think we've done a great job. We've assembled an industry consortium of 20 companies. We've developed three launch projects, but 10 industry projects. We've done diligence on 30 inventions. We've hired 20 people in 10 months, um, set up uh, development platforms. We started our first company creation. We've secured $4 million in additional funds. We, we announced this week a Pfizer CCRM innovation fund which will um, seed three projects with us a year from Pfizer. Um, we've led the creation of a coalition of translation centers globally called the Regenerative Medicine Coalition. We've started to sell IPS cells, which I think is very important for a commercialization center to have revenue. And we've advanced this very um, um, uh, ambitious project to uh, screen drugs uh, with very various partners. So our vision is to be the premier destination for risk capital leading industry and the best people in RM. And we've started to build a, a, a network to do that. We want to create a rich and vibrant startup community. We want to generate revenue, obviously, but importantly, we want to be internationally recognized as the global patent house in regenerative medicine. 
And I think this last one is very important, to create a dynamic and exciting environment to build a career in regenerative medicine, to basically create a very networked environment for people like me years ago um, to be entrepreneurs, um, but to be mentored uh, in an environment like this as opposed to starting up from scratch. So, I mean, I'm getting to the end of my talk, but why, why do we do this? Why should we do this? Um, and I read a book uh, 10 years ago by Juan Enriquez from Harvard called As the Future Catches You. Has anyone read this book? He's the best presenter ever in the world that I've ever seen, Juan Enriquez. And what he said, he, you know, language is a great example of, of a network. Words built in, or letters built into words. And really the greatest creation on the planet are metaphors. Uh, because they build so much, no, so much information into the fewest number of words. And that's what we're trying to do with science. But Juan Enriquez says that when we move from cave drawings to hieroglyphics, the Egyptian empire thrived. When those, pic, when those hieroglyphics were reduced to characters, the Chinese empire thrived and innovation was driven. When the European alphabet of just 26 letters was developed, it allowed for printing and the European culture thrived. When, and I added this, this is my addition here. When, when, chemical, when chemical engineers reduced chemistry to the periodic table and a language, the industrial revolution happened. And when in the US language was reduced to zeros and ones, there was new wealth created around the computer age and the new knowledge driven wealth. And Juan Enriquez says that if we can understand the genetic language or genetic code, it will drive wealth generation in the future. And regenerative medicine and genetic engineering are starting to merge. I mean, the reason we can make stem cells out of skin cells or blood is because we can change the genetics and drive it that way. So the wealthy of the future will have to understand this language. And what I also liked about Juan Enriquez is that he had a way of measuring wealth based on patent production. So in the US, it takes 5,000 people to generate a patent. In Canada, it takes 8,000 people. In Mexico, it takes 1.2 million people to generate a patent. At my old company and at CCRM, hopefully in the future, it took less than one. So if that trend is right, it'll be companies knowledge-driven companies generating intellectual property that will be driving the wealth and the advancement of our society in the future. So let's go back to being an entrepreneur and being an engineer. From my experience, it was, you know, it's the most exciting thing in the world to do, but also very, very challenging, again, at the interface between science and business. But I think there are three char key characteristics of an entrepreneur. Uh, did I say three? No, four, there are four there. Uh, one is being able to manage stakeholders. And, and, and what I mean by that is managing their risk tolerance. All the time I hear people say, scientists are not risk takers. Scientists are never gonna be entrepreneurs or are never gonna drive commercialization. But that's not true. Scientists are great risk takers. They just like to take scientific risk. And they'll, they'll push a hypothesis as far as it'll go. But they don't like financial risk, right? and they don't like business risk. Investors don't like scientific risk either, and they don't like commercial risk, and companies don't like scientific risk or financial risk. They're comfortable with commercial risk, marketing a product. The entrepreneur has to be comfortable with all those risks and bring all those stakeholders together. So I think there's a great role for the entrepreneur uh, managing the stakeholders. Risk mitigation really comes down to execution. Today, with the students, we listed the 100 things that could go wrong in a company creation. Until it's executed, there's a probability of failure. But once you get the patent, or you do the animal study, or you do the regulatory approval, the probability becomes one, and uh, the risk goes down. So you have to execute in order to mitigate risk. Being persistent and thick-skinned, I think everyone understands that. And then I think we need to uh, build networks to find new opportunities, synergies, leverage, and capital efficiency. And that's what this new center uh, is, is trying to do. So what are the potential future headlines out of regenerative medicine? 
Got to read, I have to step back and read this. Canadian stem cell expansion technology enables treatment of entire family from one child's cord blood. So now in the future, when, uh, if I'm a new parent and I collect my child's cord blood, I might actually be able to treat my parents in addition to my child. Um, and my parents probably will need it before my child will. Canadian-based consortium demonstrates safety and efficacy of hundreds of orphan drugs. Millions of patients to benefit with these new drug screening tools. CanCell International abandons diabetes cell therapy business in favor of a market-leading regenerative medicine cocktail. Someday we'll be able to have new drugs that actually stimulate our stem cells in our body. So we may not need cell therapy anymore. We'll just need cocktails of drugs to make our body heal from the inside. And this one I really, really like. It's based on Frieda Miller's um, technology uh, out of sick kids, which allows hair growth. <laughs> so Michael May reports on CCRM progress to York University's burgeoning engineering program in 2015. <laughs> Uh, there are lots of people to acknowledge, but I think for me, the two are, are the two uh, mentors and, and collaborators that are both very, very highly networked uh, academics. Uh, Peter Zanstra with the New Center, um, who's very networked, and Michael Sefton from Ramon, and my colleagues at both CCRM and Ramon, a number of the leaders in the regenerative medicine uh, and uh, in the community um, here in Toronto, and then these networks that were created that have really created a culture of collaboration among scientists in this space in Canada, which is very unique. Um, as I travel the world, I see how unique this is. And of course, our funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention.